Okay, so this is going to be a video response to Christy Winters. Now, let me warn you in advance that this might just get a little bit sarcastic along the way, and it is going to be quite a long video, but I hope you will find that there will be a few little gems uh, along the way. So I hope you'll persevere with me on this one uh, and join me on a journey uh, as I make a video response to Christy Winters, largely uh, to her recent video, Responses to Is Feminism Needed? Uh, in the West, which is one of these videos where I, I don't want to give the impression that she was cherry picking the responses, but it was one of these ones where perhaps judiciously she's chosen uh, a couple of, of, of people to respond to and then responded to part of what they've said, which is uh, her right, of course, and then at the end of the video decided to respond to me. This is what she said with regard to a response to me. And then finally, Noel Plum had left a series of comments and I want to address them directly. So yeah, that all sounds well and good, doesn't it? I wouldn't have a problem with that. I wouldn't have had a problem with that if that is what she'd actually done, but it wasn't. I left a whole slew of comments, including comments that clarify the original comment, the original comment when I suggested that her video was ludicrous, not because she wanted evidence that feminism uh, is no longer needed in the West, but because she's allowing everybody to choose their own definitions of equality, but then saying that everybody should agree on the same date. But if everybody's working to a different definition, then how can everybody have the same fucking date? That is what I told, I, I clarified that that is what I thought was ludicrous. Unfortunately, in her handling of it in this video, she's all those comments that I left, the video response that I made for her, she's ignored the whole thing. And if it wasn't in that original comment, she's just ignored it. And 90% of what was in that original comment, she's ignored. So that is a little bit more of an issue. Now this whole video that she made here re reminds me a little bit of a video response that she made uh, when we had our little rape culture interaction. Do you remember that? And I, I've never actually discussed this. But she made this, this, this response. What had happened was she'd had this hangout in which she peer reviewed my rape culture videos uh, and uh, are our science site is best described as rape cultures. And I responded to that. And what she did was she did a video there, responses to comments from Noel Plum's response. Uh, in which, and you couldn't make this shit up, rather than watching my videos and responding to them, what she did was, she refused to watch my videos, but read the comments that people who had watched my videos left on her video, and then tried to second guess what I must have said in my video based on their comments. I know, why would anybody do that? I don't know, but that was what she did. But the interesting thing was, because what Christie doesn't like, one of the little bugbears is when people misrepresent statistics, and yet if you remember at the top of the page, throughout that video, she, she kept reading out comments that had been left, and she read out six comments, and she kept a running tally at the top of the page of how many of the comments actually addressed the issues, and how many of them were personally insulting. And fuck me, everybody, of the six that she read out, all six of them were personally insulting. Now, what are the chances of that? That of the hundreds of comments that were left, and I think there was about 300 comments left at the time, that all six of them had been personally insulting. Now, what she never did was give the methodology by which she chose those comments. I mean, I'm sure she didn't just cherry pick the six most insulting because that isn't so. I'm sure she had some stochastic means by which she picked those comments, but she never uh, elucidated to us the, the method by which she did that. So I'd be really interested if she could clear that one up there because obviously she expected us to draw some kind of statistical conclusion from that. Now, what she did in this video, before she moved on to me, the first half of the video, is that she just she just waved away the different sort of crappiest responses that she'd got effectively. Then she honed in on two other responses she'd got. And I wanna discuss the things that she had to say with regard to that, because there's some really interesting stuff with regard to that. So let's have a little bit more Christy. First, why Canada, the US and Great Britain to name a few? I mean, if it's there's more than those, then shouldn't you name them? I mean, that's the point of having the list. And I, and I don't see any criteria here as to why these countries are the West other than that they're English speaking. So generally, I don't find your definition of the West theoretically consistent or it just seems arbitrary to me. 
So let's make no bones about this. This is a major bugbear of Christy Winters. She sets very high standards for other people's videos. And if you make a comment about something that happens in the West, then she expects you to evidence it for the West, not just a, a select handful or one specific example of a nation uh, that happens to be in the West, unless you can give damn good reasons uh, that would stand up to academic standards as to why you've chosen that nation as representative of the West of the whole. Now, now she makes the same kind of comment with regard to the second respondent. So listen very carefully about what she says here. My response to the not listing of every country in the world is like, well, okay, you can say it's a case study, you'll look at one, but it doesn't really answer the question of the West. So when people talk about the West generally, if you just say, I'm gonna to stick to my country because I know it, then you can't really then say feminism is no longer needed in the West. So, look, I've got to give her credit where credit's due. Technically, she is right there. I just kind of hope that she applies the same standard to herself and to her own material as she does to other people's material. But before we get on to that, this is kind of... I have an investment in this because this is one of the one of her six criticisms that she had in her peer review of my rape culture video, which is that I'd chosen to use US statistics for part of that. Remember, if you, if you watch my video, that I'd been quite specific and explicitly said that this video is about the United Kingdom and the United States so that kind of limited it to two countries but she seemed to have forgotten that and when she criticized me for, uh, me for it she also seemed to have forgotten that the bit in the video that I was talking about wasn't where I was comparing country with country but where I was comparing a single country uh, over time so what I was saying is that there seems to be less rapes happening in the United States now than there was 30 years ago and that's what I was showing with the data but still she had a problem with that so let me just remind you by playing a little clip of a video from back then. And then he moves on to a case study, which he selects the United States as his case study. Why? He doesn't say. Are you sure you really watched my video twice through, Christy? So why did I use the United States for my case study? Possibly because the United States is one of the two countries that my video was specifically about. I did say, are societies such as the United States of America and the United Kingdom reasonably defined as rape? cultures. So that footage was from my response video to a hangout but it shows what she'd said in a hangout, it shows my response to that and it also shows what I said in my original video there so that you can see exactly where it was. Now after I released that video she then made her responses to comment for, from Noel Plum's response where she she just made the same complaint again and said a little bit more about it so let me play you that. Another objection I had to Noel's video was that he just picked the U.S. seemingly at random. There were no theoretical grounds for choosing the United States. Um, there's no theoretical grounds for only choosing one country. I mean, you wouldn't let the creationists get away with that. So why, when you're coming to making empirical claims about what exists in the social world in the United States, or in Britain, or in France, or in Germany, or in Ireland, or in Australia, or in South Africa, or in Canada, any of these places, why weren't those countries used? Okay, yeah, so I didn't pick those other countries because radical, I know, my video wasn't about those other countries. But the point is, I, I hope I've kind of, haven't overlabored the point. Christie is very specific. If you're making a video about something in the West, or even if you're not and she just happens to think you are, um, she's very specific. Just choosing the United States as a case study is not fucking acceptable. Not acceptable at all in other people's videos. But what about in her own videos? Christy is an academic. She's a social scientist. Is she applying the same standards to her own videos? as she is to everybody else. What about if she was discussing something like patriarchy and whether patriarchy exists in the West? What would she do there? Let me play you a little clip of Christy Winters. Looking forward to this one. We're gonna talk about other societies more in the future, but let's focus on Western Europe uh, and the United States because eventually we're gonna, again, with my American bias, I'm gonna use some American data because I can make these videos faster. But we're gonna look at that cultural influence of misogyny and patriarchy in the West. What? What? So let me get this straight, Christy. You're talking about patriarchy in the West and to demonstrate that, you're going to talk about, you're going to use, just use data from the United States. Why? Because it just allows you to spew out your videos 19 to the dozen. So let me get this straight then. Using data from the United States because that's the country you're familiar with, 
not acceptable, doesn't make the required standard. Using the United States because that is one of the two countries that you've explicitly stated that is what you're talking about, not acceptable, doesn't make peer review standard. But using the United States data because it allows you to bang out your videos that much quicker, that's okay. Is that, is that it? Look, I tell you what, I'm just going to play the clip again. We're going to talk about other societies more in the future, but let's focus on Western Europe uh, and the United States because eventually we're going to, again with my American bias, I'm going to use some American data because I can make these videos faster. But we're going to look at that cultural influence of misogyny and patriarchy in the West. So I don't know, Christy, is it just me or is there just, just the slightest hint, just a sort of, I, I don't know, maybe I can just catch it on the breeze there. Maybe there's just the slightest little shaving, Christy. And we'll be talking a little bit more about shaving later on, but the slightest little shaving of hypocrisy going on, Christy, because I can't quite fathom how that is acceptable in your video and yet you make this real big play on this with regard to other people's videos. Okay, I think I've done that one. Let's move on uh, to one of the points that Christy made with one of these respondents here. So let me play you another little clip of Christy. Well, if feminism was no longer needed, then there should be no more legislation after that date because equality has been achieved. And yet in all three countries that you list, to name a few, there is still legislation going on. There are still efforts to redress gender equality. In the United States, we've had the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization debate and being passed and at the federal level. In Canada, Trudeau appointed the first gender-balanced cabinet in Canada's history in last year. And in the UK, there is still a tampon tax where women are being taxed on a basic necessity that you can't really find an equivalent for in terms of penalizing men. There's no razor tax for facial hair on men the way that there's a tampon tax for women. If feminism was no longer needed in the West, then these kinds of political actions wouldn't be necessary. Okay, so of these three things that she picks up on, I'm going to focus on the tampon tax. Why? Well, because I'm from the United Kingdom and it allows me to make these videos that much quicker. So I'm going to focus on the tampon tax, but let's be very clear in our minds what's going on here is that Christy Winters has responded to this person by giving some examples, one for the USA, one for Canada, and one for the United Kingdom, as to why feminism is still needed in those countries. She's given one example in each case, so you'd think she'd pick a pretty solid example, wouldn't you? Okay, and the tampon tax is the one that she's chosen for the United Kingdom, so I think it's worth exploring that a little bit and what the tampon tax is and what it isn't. So let me give you a little bit of background if you're not from the United Kingdom or if you are but you've only read about this in the tabloid newspapers in which case you might as well not have fucking bothered at all. So what is the tampon tax? Well it's a tax on women's tampons for women's vaginas. That's what it is. But what it also is is something that doesn't actually exist. There is no such thing as a tampon tax. What there is as a member of the European Union, we are obliged to levy VAT, value-added tax. And I don't know why it's called value-added tax, because it adds absolutely no value to anything that you buy. It just seems to make it more expensive, but we have to levy VAT on almost everything you buy. Right, and it's kind of like a sales tax. Technically, apparently, it doesn't class as a sales tax, but that is effectively what it amounts to. And the standard rate of VAT is 20% across the European Union. Now, governments are given some leeway and they can reduce the rate of VAT under certain circumstances, but the lowest that they can go down to is 5%. So it's normally 20%, and on most goods it's 20%, on some things it's 5%. The tampon tax is the reduced rate of 5%, the minimum that we can possibly apply on tampons, on women's tampons for women's vaginas. Okay, so how much, how much money does this actually amount to, this issue that demonstrates that feminism is needed in the United Kingdom? Well, let me give you some statistics. I don't use tampons myself because I don't have a vagina that bleeds. In fact, I don't have a vagina, let's be honest, okay? So I don't need tampons, I don't use tampons, but well, what I understand is that 20 tampons isn't far from the mark per month. 
right, per menstrual cycle. That's about three a day for seven days. So we're not far wide of the mark. Maybe that's why they sell them in boxes of 20. Just, just thinking outside the box of tampons there. Okay, now, the biggest brand in the United Kingdom is Tampax. And the biggest supermarket chain in the United Kingdom is Tesco. So how much does Tesco charge for a box of 20 Tampax? I'll tell you what it charges. Nice round figure. Fortunately for me, it charges £2 for a box of 20. So that means a year's worth of menstruating ladies in the United Kingdom is going to cost you, in terms of your tampons, £24. So 5%, the amount of tax that's levied on a year's supply of tampons is £1.20. £1.20 a year. If you're from mainland Europe or if you're from the United States, that is less than $2 a year. That is less than €2 Euros a year. Just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, that is the, the tax on women having vaginas. It's less than £2 a year. And that is why feminism is needed, according to Christy Winters. Now, those that campaign against the tampon tax have two uh, specific complaints that they make. The first is that they object to the fact that tampons are classed as a non-essential luxury item. How misogynistic to regard these as a non-essential luxury. But the reality of the situation is is that originally they were charged at 20%. You pay 20% on these little fuckers, not 5%. And the reason they were classed as non-essential luxuries is because by classing them as such, it, it's not a case of misogyny and hatred of women. By classing them as a non-essential luxury item, the United Kingdom government was able to reduce the tax down to the 5% level. Does that really sound like a sexist attack against women or does that sound like a pro-women move to make? To reduce the huge tax burden of buying tampons down to £1.20 a year. The second complaint is that if men use tampons we wouldn't be paying this tax. Okay now this is the problem that I have is that men don't use tampons, right? Because men don't have vaginas that bleed. But what men do have is asses that shit, okay? So this is the thing that they're saying, is how come you're paying a 5% rate of tax on this when it just applies to women, but when you have something like this that applies to men and women, you're not, this is a proper essential, right? You're not paying any VAT at all. And that's a pretty convincing argument. The only problem with that argument is the level of VAT on toilet rolls is the standard rate. It's 20%, so you're paying 20% VAT on that, as you do on toothpaste, as you do on soap, and only 5% VAT on that. Then, So rather than seeing that as a tax against women, it seems like it's the women's specific product that's got the low rate, and all the other products you're paying the standard rate of VAT. Now there's two things that I wanna make, two points that I wanna make with regard to this before I move on. The first is that one of the complaints that I had with Christy Winter's video is that different people have different ideas of equality and that we can view the same scenario and arrive at different conclusions. And this is a perfect example of this. I view this situation here where I'm paying 20% VAT on toilet paper and 5% on tampons and thinking actually it almost looks as if the United Kingdom has gone out of its way to reduce the tax burden on tampons specifically because they are a female only item. It doesn't seem very misogynistic or sexist. It actually seems like women are getting a pretty good deal. In fact, in many ways it's as if it's kind of skewed in their favour, if anything, here. Christy looks at the same thing and she sees sexism, she sees this as the actual justification for feminism in the United Kingdom to such an extent that in a situation in the video where she can only give one example, she is happy to use this as her example. Look at the difference there between how we're viewing equality. 
And the second point is, and I'll be honest, I have a kind of ongoing distrust of Christie with regard to this, is that I think she plays fast and loose with the business of, of nature nurture, empiricism versus nativism, and that she pays lip service to the possibility that one of the reasons that we experience differences in outcome and experience between the sexes, that part of the component of that could be due to biological, to innate differences, to nativistic differences between the average man and the average woman. And when I've suggested that, that, she, that, that this is not a position, that she takes quite an extreme position, in fact, she chided me for that. And I'll talk more about that later on in the video. Okay, and yet surely this is an example here. She's picking up on this as an example of sexism, that women are having to pay this 5% tax, is she not? And something that feminism needs to tackle. But surely, in the first instance at least, the reason that women pay this tax and men do not is not due to sexism, it's due to the fact that women menstruate and men do not. And as far as I'm aware, the reason that women menstruate and men do not is not because girls are taught in school to menstruate. And if we only started teaching boys in school to menstruate, then everything would be equal. And there's a little voice in the back of my head of Christy going, citation needed, uh, which is something else I'll talk about later on in the video. But as far as I'm aware, that is both medical and biological orthodoxy there, that the reason that females uh, menstruate uh, is biological and not cultural uh, in nature and so that is why women are paying this very 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 tiny amount of tax and why men are not paying this tiny amount of tax and yet Christie is seeing this as a cultural phenomena in the main here. Okay I want to play you a little bit more of that clip at the end because I want to discuss the last thing that she said in that clip. That you can't really find an equivalent for in terms of penalizing men. There's no razor tax for facial hair on men the way that there's a tampon tax for women. Okay so this was really interesting that she brought this up that there's no razor tax for men. We're not taxing men for daring to have stubbly faces the way that we dare to tax women for having bleeding vaginas. It's men's razors right for men's faces versus women's tampons for women's vaginas but what i was really what i was really interested with this part of the video christy is that i know what you always say that which is asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence and yet where was your evidence that the, these men's razors for men's faces are not being taxed where was your hitchens razor Christy. So what I thought I would do, I thought, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll help Christy out. I'll go on the government's website and I will find the page that shows that there is no tax on men's razors for men's faces. And so this was the page. The only problem with this page is that it doesn't show that there's no tax on men's razors for men's faces. What it actually shows is that there's four times as much tax on men's razors for men's faces as there are for women's tampons for women's vaginas. But at least this cleared up one thing, at least this cleared up why she hadn't applied Hitchin's razor, ladies and gentlemen. It's because she couldn't afford to pay the tax on it. It must still be there in the shop. But look, when I, when, I, when I watched the video and when I watched this bit, I thought, because I knew, I knew what the situation was with regard to this, and I thought, well, this is certainly something that I'm going to have to include in my video. But then I was a little bit disappointed to see that I'd been beaten to the, beaten to the punch, if you like, by somebody else who pointed this out in the comments. So that was a little bit of a downer that I wasn't the first person to come up with that. But what was really, really illuminating was Christie's response to having this pointed out which was that she said it looks as if all razors are taxed not specifically men's so I've got to say Christy right yeah, is anybody anybody detecting a little bit of a double standard here I mean when you thought the argument was in your favor and that tampons were taxed more than razors then they were men's razors for men's faces but as soon as you found out that actually these razors are taxed four times as much as tampons and all of a sudden you have this great big revelation that women use razors as well and all of a sudden well this isn't a gendered issue is it women use razors as well as men what are you all talking about here the really the real thing that grinds my gears with regard to this christy is that when i critique you i'm critiquing your youtube work not what you do in academia 
and yet you come back at me telling me that you're my intellectual superior and that I should effectively just defer to you because you're a social scientist and I'm a know-nothing pub philosopher. This is what you say about me, right? So I should just defer to what you say. So effectively what you're doing is you're piggybacking your YouTube work on the grounds of your academic reputation. Now, if that is true, what you're suggesting is, is that your YouTube output is some way reflective of your academic work. Please tell me, please confirm for me that when you're doing your academic work, that these are not the standards that you apply. That when you, when you come up with a series of results, if the results are along the lines of your socio-political biases, then it's the equivalent of, oh, look, it's men's razors for men's faces. But if the results don't fit in, then it's, well, this wasn't, this wasn't actually an issue of gender to begin with, right? Because if you show the same biases in your academic work as you do in your YouTube work, then your academic work must be worth absolutely naught. Because what you've done here is absolutely bullshit. Oh, and the very last thing I want to ask you before I move on, Christy, is that if taxing women's tampons for women's vaginas more than men's razors for men's faces, which is what you thought was evidence that feminism is needed in the UK. Will you confirm that now you know that men's razors for men's faces are taxed more than women's tampons for women's vaginas, do you accept that that is evidence that the men's rights movement is needed in the UK? I'd just be interested in having your input on that one, just to see how even-handed you actually are. Okay, what I want to do now uh, is to move on with the video and to start talking about the part that, that Christy actually addresses to me. Firstly, to quote from him, people are incapable of agreeing as to what equality even involves. Well, clearly people are capable of doing that because I've just shown you three studies that have been going on, one for at least 10 years, where people have been doing, at least defining equality in some way, measuring it and tracking it. And again, reasonable people can disagree, but just because something is hard doesn't mean you don't do it. In the social sciences, we deal with a lot of concepts that aren't easy to measure, but we don't throw up our hands and say, oh, can't be done. We get off our butts and we get out there and we do it. Yeah, so what Christy's doing here, as far as I'm concerned, is that she's doing this little magician's trick of waving a hand over here while she's doing something else over there. I made the point that we can't agree on what equality is, and then she mentions that and then segues into this thing about, well, people have done these studies, so it is possible to evaluate equality. And I didn't say you can't evaluate equality, I said that we can't agree by what ways we do it. And that's an entirely different thing. And that was very, very pertinent to the claim that I'd made that her video was ludicrous, because I said her video was ludicrous, because she asks these ridiculous things like, well, tell me the exact date that feminism is no longer needed. Because if feminism isn't needed, we all ought to be able to agree on a date. If you can't agree on what constitutes equality, never mind whether it's been reached, never mind whether that is really measurable, right? if you can't even agree, agree on what constitutes equality, how, even if that date had been reached, how would you actually know it? This was the point that I was making. And what frustrated me was, I had some quite interesting discussions in that thread, which she just ignored. She just stuck with this original uh, comment and just ignored all the rest of it. And I made the point to demotivate her opinion. I started talking about tax rates to give us an example, that there are different ways that you can assess the fairness of tax. And it's not that one's right and one's wrong objectively. It just depends what standards you're using. So for some people, you could make a case that a poll tax is fair because everybody pays the same. Surely everybody paying the same is fair. You could make a case that a flat rate tax is fair, that everybody pays, say, 25% on every pound they own, they owe, so the average tax rate is equal to their marginal tax rate, right? And that is fair, isn't it? Because everybody's paying the same percentage. That's got to be fair. But then surely a progressive tax rate where the more you earn, the greater percentage you pay. Surely that's fair because rich people have more capacity to pay than everybody else. So surely that's fair. Surely all of these are fair and yet they can't all be fair. And that is the problem and it's the same thing when we talk about equality. And if you can't agree on what constitutes equality, never mind whether that's even measurable, then how can you possibly start to talking and demanding that people give you dates. That is why I said that that was ludicrous. And you ignored all of this here and instead did this magician's hand-waving trick. 
And with regard to these reports, this is a perfect example of what I mean by different ideas of equality. You say they demonstrate everybody agrees. Do they really, Christy? Because all these reports use equality of outcome, not equality of opportunity. And so this is a real head-scratcher for me, Christy, because never mind everybody else, even those that self-identify as feminists that I have spoken to, the majority of those, if you say to them, what is it really you would want in a perfect world? Right, I'm not saying that equality of opportunity is possible as things are, or that it's achievable, it's been achieved, but which is it that you would want? Equality of opportunity or equality of outcome? And nine out of 10 times they say equality of opportunity. We're not demanding equality of opportunity, we're demanding equality of outcome. Gah, an addendum to say that I said that the wrong way around. Sorry, I meant they're not demanding equality of outcome, they're demanding equality of opportunity. Yet each one of these studies, Christy, measures equality of outcome. So explain that one to me if, if there's no possi po possibility for disagreement here. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these studies are worthless. And I'm not saying they don't, don't demonstrate some things. And I understand, Christy, why they choose equality of outcome, right? Because it's so much easier to measure, is it not, than equality of opportunity. I get all of those things. But unless you're saying one of two things... Either that no bollocks to equality of opportunity, equality of opportunity be damned. It's equality of outcome that we want, even if that means inequality of opportunity. Either you're saying that or you're saying that equality of outcome inexorably follows, necessarily follows from equality of opportunity. Unless those studies are asserting one of those two things, right, then, then what they're using as their metrics for gender equality are at the very axiomatic level different to what most people, including most feminists, seem to talk about when they give their own definitions about equality. So I don't think that they're very good examples. Okay, a little bit more Christy. Third, your thinking must be so fucking flat to even come up with such an absurd series of statements. Overall, equality could include a balance of inequalities and variation in outcome that are anything but easy to assess. Yeah, well, the problem is that you didn't bother to research the idea of measuring gender equality to see what the metrics are, to see what their strengths and weaknesses were before you started typing your statement. Except that that's simply not true. I wouldn't have been able to leave the comment that I left if I wasn't familiar enough with the Global Gender Gap Index to be able to make the statement that I did. Seemingly, I was more familiar with it than you, wasn't I, Christy, seeing as you weren't able to really justify the case that you were making and you just kind of shut up about it in the end, uh, didn't you? Okay, so the problem I have with the Global Gender Gap Index isn't that it's bad. Just for everybody to be clear on this, I'm not saying that it is a useless study, but the context in which Christy was throwing it at me here, which is that it is a good measure of gender equality, I dispute. And I tried to get in terms of that with a discussion that I have with Christy. So what I want to do in this next portion of the video uh, is to explain this discussion that I was having with Christy. So this is what I said in my first comment, and I'll read the comment out. Yep, and the way your 10-year study defines equality is that if 100% of people in higher education are female, then your country gets a perfect score. In fact, if women absolutely dominated every sphere of social and economic life, they would rate that country as having perfectly achieved gender equality and would rank number one in the world for gender equality. I assume that is also how you define gender equality since you deny there are issues over agreement. That is not to say it is a bad study, but just that if your definition of equality willfully refuses to consider men also and concludes that underrepresentation of men is perfect, then I'd have to question your motives. And then I put in brackets, of course, the study isn't really setting out to measure equality, but the advancement of women. So then I got a response from Christy Winters um, and the first part of the response she gave me was one of her citation needed. Now, I'm going to get, what I want to do is at the end of this video, I want to discuss Christy Winters and her citation needed just to give you a little bit of amusement at the end of this video. Um, but for now, we'll just carry on with what she'd said. So then she carried on. You're talking out of your ass again, Noel, instead of admitting you're wrong. It is why I can't take you seriously. You refuse to educate yourself. She then left another comment before I'd had a chance to, to even say anything else. And she said, just to prove how full of shit and lazy you were. She then quoted from the uh, uh, Global Gender 
gap index uh, study uh, but she quoted totally the wrong part which is why I say I don't really think that she really knew uh, as much about what she was talking about here in terms of this study than I did so I then left another comment in which I gave her the citation that she'd so politely asked for and this is what I said I'll read you a couple of the highlights on page four of the linked report and this is your required citation gender equality versus women's empowerment hence the index rewards countries that reach the point where outcomes for women equal those for men but it neither rewards nor penalizes cases in which women are outperforming men in particular indicators in some countries thus a country that has ha a high enrollment for girls rather than boys in secondary school will score equal to a country where boys and girls enrollment is the same anyway this video will be getting a response um, and at this point Christy started to get a little bit uh, aggressive on part of this uh, let, let me read you out a couple of the things that she'd said here so you've gone from asserting that gender equality is impossible to measure to objecting to a hypothetical situation that has not been observed this is like a young earth creationist. I, 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 you, I'm count, I was counting the comments down before she mentioned young earth creationists. Going from denying the world is more than 6,000 years old to objecting to a hypothetical carbon dating problem. You're a fucking idiot. Okay, so she objected to my hypothetical scenario of 100% of women in education. So I said, if you object to a hypothetical, how about Sweden? Tertiary education, 1.53 women for every man, score perfect 100. So let me show you from the, the, the Global Gender Gap Index because there's a lot of stuff in that. If you look at the full report, there is a lot of stuff in that. And it gives you data for, I think, 130 countries. And it combines them by ranking all these different metrics that you can see there. OK, we could quibble about whether they're all of equal importance and should they be weighted in some kind of a way. But I don't think it does. It just combines them all together. And as you can see at the top there, a score of 0, 0.00 equals inequality. And as far as they're concerned, a score of 1.00 equals perfect equality. You cannot score better than a score of 1.00. That's the highest score on the chart, or at least it is all but one case. So if we look here at the labor force participation there, you can see that males score higher than females, and so it ranks that down. The female to male ratio is less than one, so it scores that as less than one. It scores it at 0 0.94. If we go down to the estimated earned income, uh, there's a, the tiniest fraction of a percentage discrepancy there but effectively female to male ratio one so it scores that as perfect its equality of outcome has been achieved it scores it as one but then go down to professional and technical workers 52 percent in sweden of professional and technical workers are female 48 percent male that's a female to male ratio of 1.808 Right, women are outperforming men. So how does it score that? It gives it the score, the perfect score still of one. And this is the point that was making. The same thing, enrolment in tertiary education there, uh, except to a much greater extent, 79 uh, versus 51, 79 versus 51. That's a 1.56 female to male ratio. So big ladies and gentlemen that look on their bar, they couldn't actually fit it on the page. They had to put a little cut through there to show that that bar, they couldn't make it to scale and yet what score does that get it gets a perfect score of one the same thing with political empowerment you can see that women in parliament 56 percent male 44 percent female men outweigh women there so it scores it down as a result women in ministerial positions women outnumber men in ministerial positions does it penalise Sweden for that? No, it doesn't. It still regards that as perfect equality. So this is the way they've scored absolutely everything on here. The only one that they don't, for some utterly bizarre reason, is life expectancy. When the situation is even more, if you like, egregious in terms of measuring gender equality, because this is the one metric which generally around the world, women have outperformed men for a long, long time. Women have lived longer than men, right? So women started from the better position in terms of life expectancy, and yet for some reason they've decided in this, this uh, situation if women live longer than men you should that should be regarded as better than equality you can actually score more than one 
in this case. I have no idea why they chose to do that. So this was the point that I was making. And it was not to say that this is a bad story because in terms of working out how women's status has grown and women's empowerment and, and this kind of thing, then it is a very useful study in comparing uh, countries around the world that are in very different economic and socioeconomic circumstances. But in terms of a metric for gender equality, it's absolute bollocks. Right, because it's totally asymmetric and it does not account. Women can do absolutely brilliant in one sphere and they're not penalized for it at all. Uh, so in terms of equating, in terms of the thing that I was talking about, how do you look at women doing better in one thing and men doing better in the other and equate the two, they don't even bother. If women do better, well then that's just as good as men and women doing the same. So anyway, that just clears up the Sweden thing. Christie then goes on to make this following comment and says you refuse to do any actual work to create original content. You mere, this was in response to me saying I was making a video response. You merely parasitically feed off misrepresenting the content of your intellectual betters, by which she means her, because as I say, she's responding to the fact that I've said that I'm gonna do a video response to her. I am wondering how you distinguish yourself from Ken Ham, to which I replied, quite correctly, Ham has a beard. It's interesting at that point, she didn't ask for a citation uh, on that particular one. What I wanna do now is just to drag you down. It's really interesting actually to read all that comment. So I want to drag you down to a very enlightening comment that she left somewhere further down. So let me show you that comment now. So I don't know whether she'd left this comment to me or to somebody else, I couldn't work out that the kind of reply function's a little bit broken on YouTube at the moment and on some browsers, it doesn't put who you're replying to. But this was the comment. If population is 5149, why shouldn't every part of society reflect that biological distribution? From parenting to leisure activities, what do you see as a reason those shouldn't mirror the population? So why shouldn't outcome mirror demographics is what she's saying there. And well, surely the reason is, is because we're still keeping an eye open to the fact that biologically dimorphic factors, that nativism might play a part in this. And unless you're prepared to entirely disregard the possibility of nativistic differences between men and women, unless you're wholeheartedly ab ab accepting the tabula rasa, then, that then on what grounds can you presume that, that people's preference in these things, including parenting, she includes here, would mirror uh, the, the demographics there. And the problem that I have, the reason that I want to bring this up is that I have had this kind of discussion with Christy a number of times and she has chided me for the comments that I've made. Let me give you an example of a comment that I've made. I'd watched a video that she'd made uh, alongside her good friend, uh, Professor Moriarty from the University of, of Nottingham and Professor, Univer uh, professor Moriarty is a, he's a professor of physics. He's a, he's a big critic of Thunderfoot and of course he's a long-term adversary of, of Sherlock Holmes. And she's talked with Professor Moriarty on a number of occasions. And on one of these videos, I'd left this comment. I absolutely agree with Moriarty's comments that you read at the end there but that cuts both ways. Just as it is entirely erroneous to assume that the differential in uptake of physics at universities is nativistic, it is also equally unwarranted to assume it is entirely due to cultural factors. This was Christie's response, very interesting. Thing is, Noel, neither I nor Professor Moriarty are asserting there are only cultural factors, to which I replied, that is fantastic, then we are in agreement. The problem is, is that saying that you're not asserting that there are only a cultural factors doesn't stand in agreement with saying things that if the demographics are 5149, then everything, then why wouldn't everything in society, including parenting preferences, reflect that 5149? Those two things don't stand together. And if you want to know the reason why, then, then what I'll do is let me play you a clip from Professor Moriarty. No, no, no. Some, some, another guy. It was about the rape culture. Um, oh, no, Plum. The, the, the guy's name. Yeah, Thank no. you, Noel Plum. Um, and he makes the argument. To be fair, actually, his some of his comments are uh, quite a little bit more, um, I guess, reasonable in terms of how they how we spend a reasonable amount of time clearly thinking them through. It appears, um, but he he makes the, the the point that you know. 
or he asks, let me try and choose my words with care here. He, he, he sets it up again as this very polarized thing, as saying, well, you're saying it's purely um, nurture. We're not. Well, certainly I'm not. I'm saying we do not know, and I cannot see how we could ever know that how much of it is due to any type of um, genetic component, a biological component, and how much of it is actually due to the societal component. If, if Noel or anybody else watching this knows how we credibly decouple those two things and, and work out, okay, this is 70% and this is 30% or vice versa, please tell me because I genuinely do not know. And as a physicist, as a physical scientist looking at this problem, to me, it just seems like a mass of interrelated variables that couple together. How you would ever model that credibly, you know, to then extrapolate out to a system which has got hundreds of variables all coupled into each other, and then to credibly claim that we can pull out this is the genetic component and this is the environmental component. So I listened to Professor Moriarty there, and that was recorded after those comments had been left. That that video, that, that discussion that she'd had with him, was after that. And she, Christy linked to me that, and she said, "Oh, I bet you're going to have a big disagreement and make a big long video about this." Not at all. I listened to that, and I wholeheartedly agree with what he has to say there. And more than that, I buy that that is what he thinks. But what I don't buy is that that is really what Christy's position is. Because although she gives it lip service, that is all she gives it. Whenever she seems to apply it to anything, she seems to just disregard that component. Whether we're talking about this £1.20 a year tax on tampons, which is purely attributable really to the fact that women menstruate and men do not, right? But she just kind of ignores that even in that example. Or whether it's talking about situations such as this where she's suggesting, well, if the demographics are 5149, then why shouldn't everything be 5149? Surely she's saying that ought to be our expectation. Even parenting, even parent, and if there's one sphere where we ought to have some expectation, really good grounds to have an expectation that the average male human being will view parenting a bit different. Their parenting preferences will be different to the average hu uh, female human being. It is parenting because we are part of a series of primates and in every other primate species, mothers take their parenting more seriously than than, than fathers do. And we, we have some understanding why. We have an idea of the evolutionary pressures that drive that, and they're pretty well known. In fact, I don't know which book of his it is, but Richard Dawkins, very eloquently in one of his books, um, goes through all the different reasons that there are, and I'm not gonna bore you by making a big thing about them now, but they include things such as the greater investment that a mother makes. Uh, the greater in physical investment she makes by if she, a mammalian mother in a, because she carries that baby within her body and she supplies nutrients to that baby both in terms of overall calories but also in terms of denuding her body of things like calcium. Then even after she's gone through the very risky business of labour which can lead to her possible death, then she is still providing nutrients for some considerable period while she lactates. Right, and while the baby is suckling, so all this goes on. She ha makes a much greater physical commitment than does the male of the species. And then, of course, we have this business that it is a hundred percent certainty that that child that's popped out the mother's vagina is the mother's. So she is definitely rewarded by investing time in that offspring. That she is that she is investing time in copies of her own genes. Whereas for the father, there is always that element of doubt. And you don't need to be conscious of that element of doubt for natural selection to come into play. But it means that his rewards in terms of investing time and effort in there could actually be investing time and effort in bringing up somebody else's genetic payload there. So that's another asymmetry that we have there. And and then finally we have the fact that of course a woman can only have one pregnancy every 12 months so it behooves her to invest everything in that pregnancy whereas potentially a man can impregnate more than one woman in that 12 month period. So these are very very good evolutionary reasons, very reasonable sounding evolutionary pressures that we assume has taken place for nearly all mammals, so it certainly seems to take place with regard to all primates and yet to make the assertion that Christie is making surely 
the the the, the way in which the parenting preferences will mirror demographics fifty one forty nine in terms of how men and women view motherhood and fatherhood. You need to disregard that. In fact, more than that, what you need to you need to have gotten back from a most recent common ancestor with chimps because it still works for chimps. So in that period, and it's a short geological period, it's a short biological period for that to have happened. You'd probably even need a selection pressure running in the other direction to cancel out all those nativistic innate tendencies that we have developed for sound evolutionary reasons and that we would otherwise share with our primate cousins. So I don't know how Christie explains that. I've never heard her try to explain that. But if you're not prepared to explain that, even if you have some doubts about it, right, even if her, if, even if her preferred position is that, well, no, it's probably mainly culture and I have my doubts about the biological, if you're not going to nail your flag to the mast and say that I rule out biological factors and, and if you take culture away, men and women are identical in all these aspects, then you have no justification, do you, for saying that people's experiences and for the way that society ends up for outcomes should exactly mirror, mirror demographics, but that is what she's saying. So I'd really like to know, one, what Professor Moriarty thinks about Christie's statement there, and the second thing that I would want to know is what really is your position, Christy? If you know something that I haven't covered there, something that I haven't taken into account, such that even if we have these asymmetrical preferences between men and women, maybe underneath some large cultural veneer, but still there in the background, providing some statistical background noise and differential, right? Even if that exists, we should still expect it to match demographics. You tell me why that is, because for the life of me, idiotic, uh, intellectual inferior I may be of yours, right? And I'm not an expert in the social sciences, but I can't fathom what that could possibly be. Okay, look, some of this video has been a little bit heavy. So what I'd like to do is just to finish it off with something a little bit more lighthearted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss Christy and her love of shouting citation needed at the drop of the hat because anybody knows if there's three things if you somebody said to you what's the three things that you think of uh when somebody says uh uh, uh christy winters the three things you're probably going to think of is hitchin's razor when she can afford to pay the tax it's going to be calling everybody who disagrees with her a creationist but however spurious the people who agree with her make claims she never says the same thing to them of course and the third one would be the endless uh, demands of citation needed, citation needed, citation needed, even for seemingly the most innocuous of things. So how about this for an example? But I'll tell you what I'll do, just before I show you the comment, just let me set a little bit of background. So she'd been talking again with Professor Moriarty about this study into brains, and they'd had this study into the brains, um, which, I mean, there were, there were lots of criticisms you, you could have. Gary Edwards had said that in many ways it, it's the equivalent of studying bacteria using Google Earth, which is a kind of kind of amusing way of putting it. But even if you take on board what it said, what it showed was it, it, it railed against this idea that there's such a thing as a male brain and a female brain. And it said there really is no such thing. And there's a lot, there's a lot of crossover there. But what a lot of people have misinterpreted is saying that effectively that shows there's no real difference between male and female brains. And I've likened that to saying, to taking the fact, doing a study into people's heights and showing how much crossover there is between men's heights and women's heights and saying, actually, it turns out there's no such thing as men's heights and women's heights and that some women have heights that we'd uh, uh, of heights that we typically regard as male heights and some men uh, of quite diminutive stature of heights we'd quite typically regard as female heights but that doesn't mean that statistically there is not a difference in average height between men and women and that's the way that I think this study is being misrepresented and misused there so I, I mentioned a little bit about this study and what I wanted to say with regards to that is that what is interesting is, is that they looked for differences and couldn't find the kind of differences. And yet we know there are differences in preference between men and women. Men tend to err, for example, more towards engineering than women do. And that that is the case, whether that is... Uh, 
nativistic or whether that is empirical, whether that's learnt, whether that's culture that's driving men towards that, or whether it's intrinsic and whether we're born just favouring those things, that those things are still there one way or another. So I left the following uh, comment, okay? The differences in preference between men and women exist within our brains, whether the, or not they are innate or otherwise. Even if these differences are entirely due to culture, they still exist within our brains. Now this was Christy Winter's response to this. So to the first part, the difference in preference between men and women exists within our brains, whether or not they are innate or otherwise, citation needed. Even if these differences are entirely due to culture, they still exist within our brains. Citation needed. I kind of wonder at this point, if she's asking for a citation about that, what wouldn't she ask for a citation for? As far as I know, it is both medical orthodoxy and orthodoxy in the biological science that both our intellectual capacity and our cognitive function exist within our brains. Right, and that, so that doesn't matter if your preference, the preference that little girls have for pink, they want every fucking thing in pink, whereas little boys don't, they don't want stuff in pink, that's really girly, they'd rather have it in blue. And I think we all accept that that is culture, that's because we've taught them that, that pink's for girls and blue's for boys. But where the fuck is that stored if it isn't stored in their fucking brains? Where does Christy think it's stored so that she needs a citation? I mean, the skin is a wonderful organ, largest organ in the body, maybe it's in the skin. Maybe that preference is in the skin. The liver performs myriad functions around the body, another miraculous organ. Maybe she thinks it's in the liver, but that is not scientific orthodoxy. The scientific or orthodoxy centers our preferences and our desires and the things that we like within our brain, Christy. And the fact that you would ask for a citation, if you ask for a citation for that, you'd ask for a citation for pretty much anything um, and like I say and I'm going to wrap up with this I sometimes wonder if Christy is getting to that level well I can only think of two three alternatives either she's nowhere near as clever as she thinks she is and she doesn't actually understand the conversations that she's involved in two she's just fucking trolling or three, this is just one of her methods of avoiding answering the point. Well, I'll leave you to decide which one of those three is going on, unless you've got a different thing, uh, a different idea as to what could be going on. Well, it's been a long video. Thank you for watching uh, all the way to the end. I hope you found a few little enjoyable tidbits, as I'd promised. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.